new systems of control. But before, you know, such a movement can get started, you know, a great awakening is required. You know, we've got to awaken from this colorblind slumber we're in to the realities of race in America. Um, and we've got to be willing to embrace those who have been labeled criminals. Truly embrace them. Not necessarily all their behavior, but them. Because it's been the failure to recognize the dignity, and the humanity, and the basic worth of every human being that has given rise to every racial caste system that has existed in the United States or anywhere else in the world. So I think it's our task, really, to end not just mass incarceration, but the history of, mass, of, of racial caste in America. So thanks very much. I'd be happy to take it. Questions? Thoughts? Yeah? I'm dealing on a day to day, and I feel that in, in a big part, I'm adding to the problem, you know, because I'm basically working out dispositions on a day to day. I'm not taking very many cases to trial. I see most of my clients are black and Latino. Well, I think that there's a lot that public defenders can actually do, you know, and I understand how you can feel demoralized and discouraged seeing one case after another and watching, you know, young folks of color being locked up um, and then relegated. <laughs> you, know, you know what life holds for them after they've been branded a felon. Um, but one of the most important things I think you can do is to help reduce the shame and stigma that they experience as a result of being processed through the criminal justice system and also help their families and those who are involved in these cases understand that what's happening to them is part of something much larger. And they don't have to be passive in this process, that they can actually play an active role in resistance. And it may not feel as though they have any power when they're standing in shackles in a courtroom and a sentence is being handed down, but in fact they do. And there are prisoners, you know, across America who are beginning to organize around these issues. There are folks who, once they're released, are joining organizations like All of Us Are None, organizations of formerly incarcerated people who are organizing for their civil and human rights. And so you can begin to help connect these folks with organizations who can provide support, encouragement, and, you know, open the door to kind of, instead of just passive resignation, to active engagement and resistance. The other thing I think public defender agencies can do as a whole is begin to take account of what are all the collateral consequences of a felony conviction. You know, defendants aren't advised when they plead guilty, <laughs> um, as most defendants are, you know, encouraged to do, just plead, plead out, just take with the little amount of time that, you know, is offered to you, just plead out. Well, when you plead to a felony, you're not just pleading to that time, you're also agreeing to a whole host of forms of discrimination they may not know about. So doing the research and knowing what are all the forms of discrimination that they may face and that they may think they face that they don't. In some states, of course, you don't lose your right to vote, but many people assume that they do. Um, and in Ohio, for example, there's a coalition of groups that are coming together to keep track of all the forms of, you know, what's frequently referred to as kind of collateral consequences of uh, convictions, keep track of them and begin working with, you know, folks who are incarcerated and their families to begin advocating and legislatures to get rid of these forms of discrimination kind of one by one. Um, so I think you serve an important bridge function right, between kind of the world of advocacy and those who are most directly impacted by the system of control. Uh, many of the numbers that you were giving us were suggesting that, what, 60, 80 percent of the con drug, uh, are drug convictions that cause the felony to, uh, to be foisted on someone. So the question is, well, two questions actually. One is, do you think that, in fact, the drug laws are designed specifically to do what they are doing? Or is it simply um, a bias within the enforcement world that makes them decide that they are going to enforce the drug laws um, unfairly on um, people of color? That's the first question. And the second one is, wouldn't the solution to the problem be take away that possibility of uh, criminalizing people who use 
uh, pot by legalizing it? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be, would you agree that that was a way to work with the system, or would they just find something else to uh, incarcerate African Americans with? Well, you know, I think it's important, I spent a lot of time talking in the book to understand the history of where the drug war came from. Um, you know, most people assume that the war on drugs was launched in response to the emergence of crack cocaine in inner city communities. That's just false. You know, actually the drug war was launched a couple of years before crack hit the streets and became, you know, kind of captured public attention in the media. Um, the drug war was motivated by racial politics, not drug crime. Um, it was part of kind of a broader project that the Republican Party was engaged in then, you know, the so-called Southern strategy to try to appeal to poor and working class whites who were um, resentful of and threatened by desegregation, busing, and affirmative action. Um, poor and working class whites who were once solidly part of the New Deal, Democratic New Deal coalition, but who kind of the Reagan... Um, um, uh, the, the Reagan administration realized could be won over to the Republican Party through kind of not so subtle racial appeals on issues around crime and welfare. So the drug war was launched as a p way of trying to appeal to poor and working class white voters saying we're going to get tough on them, put them back in their place, um, and them was not so subtly defined as African Americans. Um, when crack emerged, you know, a few years later, you know, the Reagan administration responded with glee. You know, they seized on the emergence of crack cocaine in inner city communities as an opportunity to build public support for the war. They actually hired staff um, to run a media campaign to publicize crack babies and crack dealers, um, crack mothers in inner city communities, and almost overnight, you know, images of black, black you know, crack dealers and users just saturated the media and kind of forever changed our conception of who drug users and dealers are. Um, so I guess the short answer to your question is yes, there was racial motivation <laughs> for the launching of the drug war, um, but the racial motivation wasn't simply just to kind of harm African Americans. The motivation was to win over poor and working class white voters through implicit racial appeals. Just as slavery wasn't motivated by a purely sadistic desire to harm black people, it was motivated by greed, a desire to make money off of plantations. Race was the tool that was used to achieve that goal. Here, the drug war wasn't motivated solely by race, but race was the vehicle for them to achieve their political goals. And once the media imagery um, kind of saturated the news, the enemy in the war was racially defined. Law enforcement understood kind of who they were looking for. And I think the reality also is that there's no way law enforcement agencies could get away with anything remotely similar to the drug war in middle class white communities. You know, they use SWAT teams to execute routine narcotics warrants in these communities, um, you know, busting down doors, you know, frightening um, folks, terrorizing people in pursuit of the drug war, this kind of practices would never have gone over um, in middle class white communities. It's because those folks are marginalized and politically powerless that it has been convenient um, to wage a drug war in those communities um, primarily. Um, as for legalization of drugs, well, yeah, I think, you know, we should seriously consider um, legalizing some drugs in the United States. But I think it's important to recognize that we don't have to even legalize drugs to go back to what we were doing in the 1970s before we were waging an all-out war on poor communities of color. Um, and I think that there is a little bit of a temptation today um, because people have come to see that the drug war is a failure and that many of the justifications that have been offered for, you know, making marijuana illegal, for example, don't actually hold up to scientific scrutiny. Well, there's been a temptation to try to pursue kind of a colorblind approach and just argue for drug legalization as a way of mitigating the harms associated with mass incarceration. But I think that's a huge mistake. Um, yes, we can talk about drug legalization, but we need to talk about the reason 
a drug war has been waged, um, and really reckon with the role race has played in the emergence of this new system of control and how it's been, how it's been waged, if we don't reckon with that history, I do think that we're doomed to repeat it in some other form. Perhaps a new system of control we can't foresee will emerge, just as mass incarceration was utterly unforeseeable just 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, with, with that backdrop of information and the um, recent statistics, I guess, um, from the New York Times and other papers about the uh, stop and frisk procedures used by NYPD and the fact that I believe it's 87 percent of the 570,000 persons were minority and I think 94 percent of the actual stops did not result in an arrest which made it 6 percent successful I guess. Uh, with that backdrop, and this may be a weird question but I'll ask it anyway, what if any is the role of an African-American prosecutor or African-American judge with that backdrop knowing that there's a failed uh, drug policy, there's a wholesale grabbing up of minorities, there's a caste system in the jail system, and we know now that 87 percent of your stops are for nothing, or 94 percent of your stops are for nothing. What do you think, if there is a specific role uh, for African-American prosecutors and African-American criminal judges? Well, as you may know, um um, a friend of mine, Paul Butler, who has recently published a book called A Hip-Hop Theory of Criminal Justice, has argued that good people should not be prosecutors. Good people should not be prosecutors given the nature of the system, um, that there is so little opportunity um, to make a positive difference in so much damage that is done with the system as it's currently de designed that good people cannot be prosecutors. I don't know if that's true, but what I do know is that you need a lot of courage if you're going to be an effective prosecutor. And what I mean by effective, I mean a just and fair prosecutor in a system that has been designed really to incarcerate in mass poor folks of color. Um, it's going to take a lot of courage, more courage than I think most folks have. Because what it requires is constantly resisting um, all of the institutional structures and incentives that are designed to reward getting tough um, and cracking down on the bad guy as opposed to giving second chances, letting folks go, you know, charging with misdemeanors rather than felonies. There's a lot of things that prosecutors can do to mitigate the harm of the system, um, but it takes a lot of courage and there won't be many folks in your office that are supportive of what you're doing. Um, so I think folks who are interested in being prosecutors have to ask themselves, you know, what is my tolerance level um, for, you know, facing a lot of disapproval within my office. And I think most lawyers are accustomed to, you know, seeking institutional rewards. They did well in school, they like to be patted on the head for doing a good job and um, making great arguments. And the question is, are you willing to be fired? Are you willing um, to make arguments to your boss um, and to law enforcement officers and DE agents who you'll be working with that they won't like? Um, if you're willing to do that, then I say, yes, there may well be an important role for you. Um, but if you lack that kind of courage, then I think you may legitimate the system far more than you undermine it. Um, I don't spend a lot of time talking about life behind bars. Um, I do spend a little bit of time talking about the fact that, you know, of course, corporations today now use prison labor, um, you know, to avoid paying minimum wage and providing benefits to workers and that prisons in many respects now provide kind of the economic base for many, you know, predominantly white rural communities that plantations once provided. Um, but do I talk about life in prison? and? No, not much. No. Um, about the uh, movement that we need to build and 
couple of things I thought you might reflect on in particular, since you mentioned affirmative action. I'm really struck by how much more um, uh, public attention there seems to be to the affirmative action fights um, and 